Bibles tonight, would you, in our study, we're going to go to the book of Psalms, and tonight we're going to look at Psalm chapter 34 is our passage tonight, Psalm chapter 34, and a beautiful psalm here, and uh, there's 22 verses in this, and we won't get to go over each one, but I want to just pull out some things from this, this beautiful chapter here in the Psalms. Uh, think about this, how would you feel if your bank decided to credit your account $86,400 every day. The catch is this, that um, when they give you the $86,400, you have to spend it all in that day. And if you don't spend all of it, they take the money back. You can't, can't keep it in there, can't save it up. You have to use it. And that every day you get another $86,400. Every day. How many of you would be okay with that? Okay, I, I would too, I think. And uh, you say, wow, that's, that's a lot. That's being entrusted with a lot. That's true. But think about it this way. Did you know, in a parallel way, did you know that God Almighty entrusts to us 86,400 seconds every day? There are 86,400 seconds in 24 hours. And, you, and guess what? You can't save them up. You've got to use them in that day. And you, on another day, you get another 86,400 uh, we don't want to waste any of that time that God has given us. Someone wrote, uh, just a tiny little minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Now, as I read Psalm 34, really what I see here is this is a psalm that has a lot of rich counsel in it, and really it gives us instructions on how to live each day of our life. It's a very thorough psalm, and this is called an acrostic psalm. Now, what is that? An acrostic psalm is a psalm that goes through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, we have 26 letters in our alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet has 22, and each of the 22 verses here begins with the alphabet. And it's almost as if... David is going from A to Z, or we could say, really in Hebrew, it's, it's Aleph to Tav in the Hebrew letters. It's like David is saying, from A to Z, I want to tell you how to live each day of your life. Now, when did David write this, and what is the background of this? We want to do that. A lot of times we study psalms. It's helpful to know the background and the occasion upon which the psalm is written. Well, if you look above verse 1, it has a little uh, subtitle there, a little description of the psalm where it says, A psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. Abimelech is, a, of course, a, a dynastic title, like the title Pharaoh. There were many pharaohs. There were many guys in the Bible called Abimelech um, because, again, it's a dynastic title, many different men uh, that carried that title. And on this occasion, this was the king called Achish, the uh, king of the Philistines, that it's referring to here. And in other words, what happened in David's life is that uh, he, uh, he almost died. He, he came into a very difficult situation. It was kind of a, um, a close call. Have you ever had a close call in your life? This is certainly what happened to David. It seems like here lately I've heard of so many people that just have died unexpectedly, sadly. And we, and we pray for their families. Uh, you know, some of you uh, no, recently we prayed for the family of Mike uh, Kaler, who is a friend of, uh, of Gregory Wyatt down here, and uh, he's a young man who just, he, in the Raven Stadium, uh, he tripped and he fell and hit his head, and sadly he passed away, just so unexpected. My friend Derwin Kicker, who was a pastor in Missouri, and I got to know him on some of our archaeological digs in Israel, just came in one day and had a heart attack, and he was gone. Found out about another friend who lives in Arkansas, a very dear, godly man, a deacon of a church I pastored when I was going through seminary, who came in after work one day and suddenly just had a heart attack, and, and he died. They couldn't revive him. And, and on we could go. Well, you never know what a day's going to bring. You never know what uh, kind of close call you're going to have. And David has one of those kind of close calls. Go to 1 Samuel real quick. Look in chapter 21. Let's look a little bit about what happened behind the writing of this psalm. This is a story I'm sure that you're familiar with. This is when David was running from King Saul. He was the anointed king of Israel, and Saul didn't like it. 
and Saul hunted him down to try to kill his rival. And as David is running, he runs to the enemy. Look in chapter 21, look in verse number 10. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did not not sing one to another of him and dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands? And so David, out of fear, does something that we would think is unthinkable. He runs to the enemy and he seeks refuge in the enemy camp. Uh, he goes to Gath. Now, where is Gath? Gath is one of the five major cities in the land of the Philistines. Gath is the hometown of the giant Goliath. Uh, we, we would want to ask David, David, why are you going there? Why are you going to the, to, to the very city of the, of the champion that you defeated? This would be the, the last place you would think you would go, but you can almost get inside the mind of David and maybe think about what he's thinking. He's thinking this would probably be the last place that Saul would look for me. So he's really kind of thinking on his own about how to protect himself. And he's hiding in the enemy camp, but what he does inadvertently is he puts himself in a dangerous and compromising situation. The people of God, God's people, were to have nothing to do with the surrounding nations, the Philistines. But David was looking for a quick way out. You know, um, there's a huge temptation when you're going through a difficult time to run perhaps to the wrong refuge or to perhaps take the easiest way out or perhaps to compromise uh, your convictions looking for refuge. And while David is there at Gath, there were some men who recognized him. And as we saw in verse 11, a few of the guys, perhaps soldiers that were there at the Valley of Elah and saw what happened to Goliath and then later heard of the songs that were written about David uh, Saul has slain a thousand, David is ten thousand, and some of them were saying, "Hey, isn't that the guy that killed Goliath?" Um, I think David had red hair, so he kind of stood out in a crowd. Uh, the Bible says he was ruddy. That's the, what the Hebrew word means. So I prefer to believe that. It could mean that he had a red face from the sun, but I don't think that's the right interpretation for obvious reasons. So they, and they recognized him. They said, "This is this is uh, that guy, David." And look at verse 12, and David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And so he's found out in the city. David knows he's in trouble. And so what does he do? He, he goes into deception mode, basically. He pretends to be insane in verse 13, and he changed his behavior, his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. So he just pretends to be crazy. He pretends to be insane. He does two things. He, does, he writes graffiti on the gates. I think everyone who writes graffiti, graffiti are a little crazy. I'm just kidding. But uh, he takes and he writes graffiti on the, on the city gates. And some, some scholars think it was some kind of nonsensical symbols maybe associated with uh, cultic curses or things like that. But either way, the uh, Parks and Recreation Department of Gath didn't appreciate that since they were going to have to uh, wash the gates. And then he did another thing. He let saliva run down into his beard. He just becomes a slobbering mess, if you can just think about that. And, you know, you have to remember that back in this culture, a beard was an important symbol of manhood. Um, uh, any mistreatment of one's beard uh, really was a sign that the guy wasn't all, all, altogether there. And so he's pretending, again, to be crazy. And so they bring him before the king, and King Achish's response is humorous, I think. Look at verse 14. They bring him to the king, and then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, Ye see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Verse 15, have I need of mad men? Do I need crazy, any more crazy people? Why are you bringing them to me? Get them out of here. You know, there was, a, there was a law in the East that basically it was a code that you did not put an insane person to death. They believed that an insane person was possessed of the gods. And so, therefore, in a way, they were kind of... Um, sacred. Uh, they were just off limits. And so 
they believe that harming an insane person would be bad luck or it would bring upon them the judgment of the gods. And so by David pretending to be insane, he was protecting himself, but he was really using a lie to protect himself, using deception to do that. And so he's basically kicked out of Gath. Look in chapter 22, verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when he and his brethren saw all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. So David then now is in the cave. Uh, He's there by himself again. He's hiding away from Saul. And it was upon this occasion that David, after this close call, he could have been very easily put to death there at Gath. But upon this close call, David goes to the cave, and he's thinking about what had happened, what had just happened in his life. And he picks up a pen, and he writes down this psalm. Go back to Psalm 34. He writes this psalm upon this occasion. Now, this psalm is really a combination of a, it's a thanksgiving psalm. He's thanking the Lord for his deliverance, but it's also, I think, he's pondering some of the foolish things that he had done Perhaps he's feeling a bit of shame and embarrassment and humiliation over this recent episode in his life. And he's thinking about how easily his life could have ended right there had it not been for God, had it not been for the Lord in his life. And so what I like to really call this psalm is how to live each day. David, in this psalm, really just gives us a a list of instructions and exhortations on how we should live each day of our life. This is pretty good counsel that he gives us. I think it's a very rich psalm. But I'd like to divide his instruction up into four areas or four general exhortations with some um, uh, sub-exhortations underneath. And so just four things we need to decide to do each day of our life. And here's the first one. Number one, each day make a decision to praise the Lord. Look at verse number one. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Upon this occasion, David makes a decision that each day he's going to praise the Lord. And notice in these first three verses, three times he mentions the divine name, the word Lord in all caps, And in verse 2, it's in the emphatic position in the Hebrew. David, again, understood that his deliverance was from God. He's not boasting in his own cleverness or in his own ingenuity or skill to escape. He's boasting in God. And that's what praising God is all about. It's not boasting about what we have done, but what God has done. You know, a lot of times I'll hear Christians give testimonies, and I, I love to hear that, but every once in a while it might start kind of getting into more of here's what I've done instead of really pointing to what God has done. And David's careful not to make that mistake here. In verse 2, he says, my soul makes her boast in what? In the Lord. God is the object of his praise. 16 times in this psalm, he mentions the name of the Lord. And look at the verbs in verse 1 through 3. Bless the Lord, verse 1. Boast in the Lord, verse 2 magnify the Lord, verse 3. And I think in a sense, David in that third verse is inviting all of his men around him to join him in praising the Lord. Praising the Lord is something that we must do, we should do all the time, every day. Now notice some things that we learn here. Uh, uh, Praising the Lord is personal. Notice who, who's to do it. David said, I will bless the Lord. You see, no one can praise God for you. You understand that? Sometimes we come to God's house, we may not be involved in the singing and the worship. Well, you know what? You need to do it because if you're silent, no one in that seat's going to take your place. You need to praise the Lord. No one can praise God for you. You know, church attendance is not a spectator sport. We're all to participate. You can hear someone preach, you can come hear someone sing. But if you don't praise God, you're not really into uh, the service. You've robbed yourself of one of the greatest joys you can have, I think, and you're robbing God of the glory that belongs to him. So who should praise the Lord? It's personal. It should be you. When? It's perpetual. Look again in verse 1. At all times. 
in the good times, in the bad times, in the fruitful times, in the dry times, in the up times, in the down times, whatever time it is, in the daytime, in the nighttime, David said, at all times. You say, well, can I praise God when I'm hurting? Friend, that's the best time to praise God when you're going through a difficult time. Praise him and turn the bad times into good times. Someone said, if you're having difficulty in your prayer life, pull out some groans and shove in a few hallelujahs. That should help you in your prayers. So just praise the Lord. And then why? Uh, Praise should be purposeful. Because David says in verse 3, or verse 2 rather, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. If I don't praise the Lord, others aren't going to hear. Did you know that when you praise God sincerely from your heart, it blesses others? It encourages others? So, friend, make a point. Make a decision each day to praise the Lord. But here's number two. Each day, make a decision to seek the Lord. Look at verse number four. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And so David is seeking the Lord. Look at verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Look at verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. There's a reason why David is called the man after God's own heart, because David was constantly seeking the Lord. Do you seek God? I mean, daily in your life, do you seek him? Earnestly, diligently seeking the Lord? When I was a young Christian, someone handed me a book. The title of the book was The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's a great book. And A.W. Tozer wrote something here that I want to read to you. He said this, Why do some persons find God in a way that others do not? Why does God manifest his presence to some and let multitudes of others struggle alone in the half-light of imperfect Christian experience? Of course, the will of God is the same for all. He has no favorites within his household. All he has ever done for any of his children, he will do for all his children. And then he says this, the the difference lies not with God, but with us. The problem is, is that We're not seeking God. We're not pursuing after God. Now, some people might think, well, you know, once I'm saved, I don't need to pursue God anymore, and that's not true. You see, once you learn of God and salvation, the natural thing is going to be you're going to want to learn more of God. The more we get to know of God, the more that we want to know of God. It kind of has that effect. Matthew Henry is right when he said, whenever there is true grace, there is a desire for more grace. And so we should seek the Lord. Let me give you some reasons why David gives, because he delivers us from our fears. He said that in verse number four, I sought the Lord, he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I love that when he says all my fears, not just a few, but all of them. Do you know, I was doing some research on this. You know how many phobias there are, according to the psychiatric handbook? There are over a hundred phobias. And I'm not going to list all of them to you. Of course, we know the basic ones, but I was surprised to read some of the unusual phobias. It includes electorophobia. You know what that is? That's the fear of chickens. Then there is another one, uh, pagonophobia. That's the fear of beards. And then nephophobia. That's the fear of clouds. And uh, it's just, these are just kind of some crazy fears here, and on we could go. What are the things that you're afraid of? What are the things that really just cause you anxiety, that cause you a sleepless night? I, one time I listed a few of the things that really I fear the most, and I brought those to the Lord. You know, the way to get victory over our fears is to do what David did and to seek the Lord. And I love the response What David says, he didn't deliver me from just some of my fears. He delivered me from all of my fears. Because when you're seeking the Lord, he's going to give you a peace over all those things. But here's the other thing. 
He saves us from our troubles. Look at verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The word trouble here, the Hebrew word, is a word for a tight place or a difficult situation. And I would remind you that just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're not going to have difficulty. And I bring this up because there are some Christians that feel that way. Man, once I'm saved, everything should be all roses and no thorns, all mountains and no valleys, and that's simply not realistic. The Bible says, <clears throat> Paul said to the converts in Acts 14, that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. Some of the troubles that we have are due to our own mistakes, and this is the, certainly the situation here with David. David was in a tight spot because of his own decision, and partly also because of Saul. Some of our problems that we deal with in life are due to the sins that other people commit against us, and again, that was certainly true of David. He had his share of troubles. He had his share of afflictions. Fast forward to verse 19 of chapter 34 there. Let me show you this verse. <clears throat> chapter 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them. What? There's that word again. All. Oh, God will take care of all those things. He delivers us from our fears, all of our fears. He saves us from our troubles. That's another reason to seek God. But also, he satisfies us with his goodness. Look in verse number 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man that trusteth in him. David invites the readers to taste the goodness of the Lord for themselves. You can only know how something tastes when you experience it yourself. Something might look like it tastes good, but that you won't really know until you taste it for yourself. How many of you, don't raise your hand, have ever seen something that looked good, but then when you tasted it, it was just horrible? Of course, husbands, that was never the case with any meal that your wife fixed, right? But we can relate to that. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. You have to taste and see it for yourself. Let me tell you something. God's grace looks good, but it tastes even better. But the only way you're going to know that is to experience it for yourself. And, and look at the uh, comparison that David gives in verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. I think David is out there in the wilderness. He's living in a cave. As he's writing this psalm, he might look around and even see some young lions out there in that wilderness, and they were hungry lions that we're doing without. And he says, you know, even the young lions, now lions are fierce. They're, they have a lot of energy. And uh, you wouldn't think that a young lion would suffer any lack, but David says, even they. And you can kind of, you know, make the application even for today. There's a lot of people in our world today, and they're very skilled. They're very energetic. energetic. They're very fierce in going after things for themselves. But that's no guarantee that they'll never be without. They're trusting in their own strength. But David, in contrast to that, says, but they that seek the Lord shall not want, or we could say lack, any good thing. By contrast, those who are seeking God, God's going to make sure that you have what you need, that you'll not suffer lack. That's another reason to seek the Lord. Each day, make a decision to praise the Lord. Each day, make a decision to seek the Lord. But here's number three. Each day, make a decision to fear the Lord. Look down at verse 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Here's another instruction that David gives. Learn to fear the Lord. Look down at verse number. Uh, we saw this in verse 9. Uh, back up to verse 9. Oh, fear the, the Lord, ye his saints. For there is no lack to them that fear him. And again in verse number 11, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You know, I think one of the greatest problems with our culture today is that there's no fear of God. I heard about a professor in a Christian college that mentioned fearing the Lord, and he expected all the students in there to agree with him, but he was shocked to find out that none of the students in there agreed that you had to fear God. They, they thought that just loving God was enough. You don't have to fear God. And that's kind of in our culture today. You know, you're not supposed to be afraid. 
In fact, there's a, there's a popular slogan out, no fear. You ever see that? It's on clothing. No fear. It's in commercials. But when you think about it, having no fear is really stupid. You know, little children who don't fear things can get badly hurt if they don't have a proper fear. Fear is a good thing, and it's especially true in the spiritual realm. Having the right fear will help us spiritually. We're talking about fearing sin and what sin can do. But then, most importantly, what David's talking about here is fearing the Lord. God one time said in Deuteronomy 5.29, all that their hearts, talking about his people Israel, all that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments so that it might go well with them and with their children. And God here sounds like the parent of a wayward child. You know, he longs for his children to fear him. Why? Because he loves us and he knows that the proper fear will keep us safe. What is the fear of the Lord? The best definition I have ever uh, read about the fear of the Lord is this. The fear of the Lord is a reverential attitude that leads to right actions. A reverential attitude that leads to right actions. If you truly reverence God, it's going to cause you to do the right things. And David kind of gives us a list of things here when he says, I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. He gives us some things here. Look in verse 12. First of all, if you want to fear the Lord, do what's right. Look at verse 12. What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? The word good here means morally good. Uh, it doesn't speak of possessions or status or fame, but what's wholesome, what's morally right? This is part of fearing God, desiring what is good, but then refusing to lie. Look at verse 13. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. It may be that when David wrote this, he was thinking back to what he had just done. He kind of engaged into some deceptive behavior and in a way, you know, used a lie to help him. And he's thinking about that and he's come to the conclusion that, you know, I'm not going to be a part of deceit. I'm not going to speak lies. Uh, he makes that decision. And I've said this before, that if a person will just determine in their life that they'll never tell a lie, that will act as a shield for you against temptation. It will be a protective barrier around you. If you just determine in your heart that you'll always speak the truth, the devil will not have a foothold in his temptation in your life. It's a barrier around you. But then depart from evil. This is the next thing. Look down in verse number 14. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Depart is the word that means turn away. This means wherever evil appears, you disappear. Stay away from it. Depart from evil. And then the next thing is seek peace in verse 14. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Be a peacemaker. Don't go around with an angry attitude ready to unleash on someone. Maybe it's me, but in my whole lifetime, I've never seen a time when people are more angry than they are right now. We live in an age of rage. Don't be bothered by every little slight or by everything that someone says to you. Be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. And then remember God sees and hears you. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are open are upon the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers. You know, God's watching, God sees you. You ever notice there are some people that work a little bit harder when the boss is right there walking around? I remember when we had a Christian school here, I was the administrator. I practiced what I called MBWA. What was that? Management by walking around. Because I noticed that if I was walking around in the hallways, always around, you know, the mischievousness went way, way down. Very little problems. We have to remember that, listen, you know what? Uh, others can't always be watching us, but God always does. He's always watching. He sees everything you do. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers. But in contrast, here's the next thing. Remember, God judges sin, verse 16. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And so... Uh, remember that God judges sin. If you just practice these things and do these things, you will be practicing the fear of the Lord 
a healthy fear of God. So each day, make a decision to praise the Lord. Each day, make a decision to seek the Lord. Each day, make a decision to fear the Lord. But here's the last thing. Each day, make a decision to trust the Lord. Look at verse 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Here's that word, all again. God's going to deliver us from all our troubles. I love verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. And so here, by the way, the word for trust, drop down to verse 22. Let me show you this verse. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants. None of them that trust, see the word trust there. None of them that trust in him shall be desolate. The word here means to take refuge in. Each day we need to decide to trust God, or we could say take refuge in him every day. And I think David was still, was still learning this. He learned from his mistake. He, he took refuge in the wrong place. Instead of trusting, making a willful decision to trust in the Lord, he ran to the world for his help. Beloved, don't ever do that. Always make the Lord your refuge. Always run to him. And I love where it says that God is nigh unto the broken, those that are of a broken heart in verse 18. The time to trust God is when you are broken. It might be that there's some people here tonight and you're broken over something. Maybe you're broken over the own, your own sin. That's a good place to be. If you've come to a place of brokenness over your own sin, God's doing a sanctifying work in you. Or some people may be broken because of their, your circumstances in life, the sufferings that you've had to endure. Something may have happened that crushed you. You have to make a decision. Where are you going to find your help at that time? Who or what are you going to trust in? And the encouragement here is that you find your refuge in God. Run to God. In fact, I would say that the reason that God allowed you to be broken is because he wants you to come to him. You know, when we were, we were over in England, I love the opportunities to go over and visit my, my grandsons. And uh, the one thing about going over there, it's almost like you kind of get reacquainted, you know, after you've been away from them for so long. And there's always that initial... Um, break in the ice, get reacquainted, you know. And with little Theo, it just seemed like this last trip, he was just a little bit more standoffish, playing real shy, and uh, he wouldn't come near, you know. And, uh, but all that changed when he was playing with a toy, and the toy broke, and he was upset about it, and he came straight to me, Paul, Paul, fix this. Now, he had no idea that I can't fix anything. But in his mind, Paul Paul can fix this. And all of the inhibitions were gone. All of the reservations in him were gone. And he sat down next to me, you know, watching me struggle <laughs> over fixing this. But you know what? Out of that, there was a closeness that reemerged between me and Theo. And you know what? We're, we're, we're the same way. A lot of times we may be standoffish in our relationships with the Lord. We may not be pursuing him. But when brokenness comes in our life, you know what? We, we run to him. And we say, God, fix this. Take care of this. The reason the Lord allows brokenness in our life is because he indeed wants to draw us close. And he wants to use us. You know, when we break something, we throw it away, but God doesn't use anything until he breaks it first. That's just the way it is with God. He uses what he breaks. And so brokenness isn't a bad thing. A farmer can't really plant a crop until he breaks the soil and then sows the seed. Jesus didn't feed the multitudes until he broke the bread. The sinful woman could not pour the costly perfume over Jesus until first she broke the alabaster box. And so there seems to be a pattern in Scripture where God breaks something, God uses it in a great way. And this is what the Lord is doing in our life. When we get into a situation where there is that brokenness, we need to make a decision to find our refuge in God, to run to Him. And so these are the things that we must do each 
day. Each day, make a decision to praise the Lord. Each day, make a decision to seek the Lord. Each day, make a decision to fear the Lord. Each day, make a decision to trust in the Lord. And that's a good day. If you can do all that, that will be a good day. If you learn to do these things. Let's, let's bow for prayer tonight. And so, Father, indeed, teach us these things. Help us, Lord, to run to you in our time of brokenness and to praise you, Lord, even in the difficulties, to praise you and to seek you and to fear you. So, Lord, draw us close. There may be some here tonight that just need to draw near to you. Lord, I pray that you'll do that work in their heart of drawing them close. May we learn these things. May we practice these things each day of our life. And, beloved, with heads bowed and eyes closed, will you just take a moment there and just, in your own way, in your own prayer, just reach out to the Lord and draw near to him tonight. Maybe as you're there, just just praise the Lord. Seek him right even now while you're there. Just seek his face. And in your brokenness, put your trust in him. Let him be your refuge tonight. Bless these words to hearing hearts tonight. Use it for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name.